yes, there will be sort of exciting announcements and changes in the works. So please, everybody, make sure that you are going to join us for your for our, our subsequent. Will it be a violent coup to turn the new leader? Yes. <laughs> yes. There should. It should be like a sort of a combat thing, shouldn't it? Yeah, there'll be blood in the Passaic River. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And the loser's buried by the metal hands. <laughs> <laughs> right here, Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> yeah. God bless New Jersey. I'm from, I'm from Staten Island, if you didn't know, so basically a native son. All right, go on, Alita. Exactly. You get, we, get, we get to joke about these things. Yes. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> welcome to this week's happy hour discussion. We are talking about the state of Second Amendment jurisprudence. We... Um, We'll be talking about uh, Professor Blackman's own case that he had before the Third Circuit, as well as an, inter an interesting decision that um, produced a great dissent by our friend and former fearless leader, Judge Paul Mady. Um, that came out last week and was highlighted yeah. in a nice um, editorial in the Wall Street Journal. The question for us today what will it take to get Supreme Court review of repeated encroachments on the Second Amendment? And are the decisions being produced at the circuit court level consistent with the Supreme Court's decisions in Heller and McDonald? Um, just brief housekeeping, mark your calendars for our joint event. We are not going to be doing a Friday this coming week. We will instead have a week Tuesday a joint event with um, our fellow Third Circuit chapters, who is Justice Antonin Scalia, that will feature Ed Whalen, Judge Sutton, and Ooh. moderated by Judge Phoebus. That's awesome. Um, and then announcements forthcoming for the for the last Friday in September. That, um, that, that Scalia event is on the 22nd. What did I say? Did I not say? You didn't I don't say anything. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes. Tuesday, September 22nd, 6 p.m. So, all right. So to introduce our, I mean, Josh has been with us before. We know him, we love him. He is, of course, um, an associate professor of law at South Texas College of Law in Houston, where he specializes in constitutional law, the US Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He is the author of the critically acclaimed, unprecedented, the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare and Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty and Executive Power, and also co-authored the fantastic casebook with uh, Randy Barnett on Top 100 Cases, which is a great read and you should buy it if you have it already. Blogs at joshblackman.com and he is prolific. Nice, nicely done. Um, very nicely done. And um, he is prolific on all platforms. He is the author of over three dozen law review articles, um, and his commentary has appeared in all manner of mainstream press. Um, really excited to have you um, talk to us today about this topic that seems to have excited a lot of us because it's just um, something that's just been percolating along for a while now, and you actually had a case in the Third Circuit. So Josh, I did. the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. I would much rather be home I'm from Staten Island. I haven't seen my parents in, my God, almost seven months, so it's, it's been rough. I would much rather be in New Jersey, which means my dad would be sitting in the audience uh, and would be you know, celebrating afterwards. But unfortunately, we're all here in our living rooms, stuck on Zoom, so uh, uh We are in the year 2012. You may remember a date, June 26, 2008. Um, I remember that date. That was the date Heller was decided. 12 years ago was Heller. Uh, I remember the day well. I was a summer associate at the time, a second year law student. Um, back in the good old days, the uh, law firms would fly you to uh, exotic locations for these summer training programs. I was in Los Angeles, and I remember waking up like at six in the morning to try to get the Supreme Court opinion in time. And I remember reading it. It was around 7 a.m., and the opinion dropped, and I was so excited. Um, I had actually served as a re research assistant for Nelson Lund at George Mason Law School. And I was his RA for his Heller brief. Um, so I actually played a minuscule role in, I think, one of the more influential amicus briefs in the case. So I felt a, a personal kinship 
Um, Alan Gura actually did a moot court at Mason, right, in our building. So I, I felt a, a closeness to the litigation that, that, that it really mattered to me. So I started reading the decision. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. The Second Amendment protects an individual right. The D.C. gun law was unconstitutional. Isn't this great? But then I kept reading. And I kept reading. I'm like, huh, what's this? Where did this stuff come from? And there's this language about regulations in sensitive places. Sensitive places. And there's language about dangerous and unusual weapons. Not dangerous or unusual, dangerous and unusual. Tell that to the Third Circuit. We're going to get to that later. I'm like, huh, where did this stuff come from? This is not originalism. What is? What is this? What am I reading? And then... Some advocates for the Second Amendment became very nervous. Nelson Lund, who I mentioned earlier, was my professor. He was adamant that this was bad, that the dicta in this case would undermine any future legal challenges and would render the Second Amendment basically a dead letter. I didn't believe him at the time. I thought he was being you know, too pessimistic. Uh, by the way, Nelson's usually right. So if you ever meet Nelson, you can't miss him. The guy's like eight feet tall. Just, he's usually right about things. So always give him his due. It's not that, he's not eight feet tall, but he's very tall. Um, he's also, and I hang with people who are pessimistic. He might be the most pessimistic. But he, 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 I think he was right. So let's go now fast forward two years after Heller to McDonald. Um, this was the follow-up case, which asked whether the Second Amendment was what's called incorporated. That is, does the Second Amendment limit the state governments as it does the federal governments? Um, this was a case involving Otis McDonald, who was a, uh, a black man from Chicago, who lived in the rough side of town, and he did not trust the Chicago PD to protect him. Smart move. Um, and he wanted a handgun to protect himself in his home. McDonald won, and there were five votes to uh, declare the Chicago gun law unconstitutional. Um, there was no majority, as many of you know. There were four votes to incorporate through what's called the Substantive Due Process, the Due Process Clause. And then Justice Thomas concurred, and he would have relied on the Privileges or Immunities Clause. That's a fun debate maybe for another, for another time. But the court said nothing about the scope of the Second Amendment. It basically just reaffirmed whatever Heller said. And by that point, July 2010, I had a blog, and I remember I wrote on it that McDonald and Heller were epic failures. This was my lingo back then, right? They were epic fails, right? I was starting to get a dose of Nelson Lund's pessimism. I started thinking, what's going on here, right? We're now two years after McDonald. The court had not set a tier of scrutiny. They didn't say which party bears the burden of proving a violation. They didn't say what types of weapons are protected. They didn't say where they're protected. Everything was left uncertain. And I was critical of Justice Scalia. I was critical of Justice Alito for leaving these issues sort of lingering in the wind. And I'll tell you, I was criticized by people of the Second Amendment camp. Uh, Alita probably knows these people. They were not happy with me because I was sort of poo-pooing their parade, right? You had McDonald Heller, this pow-pow, back-to-back. In 200 years, you had nothing the Second Amendment. And they have all this in two years. Josh, don't be such a Debbie Downer. Um, but I just, I didn't feel like this was heading in a good direction. And soon enough, it became clear that the most important opinion Heller was not Scalia, uh, but it was actually Justice Breyer. And Justice Breyer's dissenting opinion became what I think was the shadow majority opinion. And I don't say that lightly. I am not a Breyer fan. But I think if you read Breyer carefully, his sort of interest balancing approach, where you weigh the pros and the cons, is exactly how the courts of appeals have followed suit. In the years following Heller, we have decisions from liberal judges and conservative judges. And almost all of them reviewed gun laws with this deferential balancing test. For example, the phrase in Heller was dangerous and unusual and conjunctive. Judge Easterbrook in Chicago in the Seventh Circuit said, no, 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 it's dangerous or unusual. So even if a weapon is quite common, if it's dangerous, you can't have it. So even they're not, they're, they're even dismantling the language in Heller, right? They're, they can't even follow the damn test. So for example, the, 
the Third Circuit case Lita mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier involving uh, magazines. There are tens of millions of magazines in the United States that hold 10 rounds. Millions of them. You cannot say they're unusual. But the court basically took a scalpel and said, well, they're dangerous. And how common they are doesn't matter. It matters if they're dangerous. So even Justice Scalia's best efforts to constrain the dicta has failed. But anyway, that was still 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. I'm starting to get really upset. Give it time, we were told. Wait a few years. And the court will clarify the doctrine. They'll catch up, right? Everything will be cool. The Second Amendment's now normal law, we were assured. 11, 12, 13, 14, and Zippo. At this point, things were not looking good. The Supreme Court had nothing to say about this issue. Every circuitition was denied, denied, denied. Finally, we get to 2015. But it wasn't a cert grant. It was not a majority opinion. It was a dissent from denial of certiorari. There actually were two of them. Justices Thomas and Scalia dissented in two Second Amendment cases. And Justice Thomas was livid. He said the Supreme Court is treating the Second Amendment as a second-class right. The court routinely grants review in every case involving, um, you know, free speech, abortion, the Fourth Amendment, whatever provision of the Constitution you want, they're going to take a case. But they treated the Second Amendment like a leper, right? They just did not want to touch it, or maybe like a COVID. You know, they, they, just, they just don't want to touch it. They put, they put the Second Amendment in a bubble. Maybe that's the analogy, a uh, plexiglass bubble. Um, and they did not want to touch it. And at the time, I wrote an article in National Review in December of 15, and I said the lower courts continue to whittle away Heller MacDonald, while seven justices stand by quietly, refusing to intervene. And then things got worse. Three months later, Justice Scalia, of blessed memory, passed away. Um, that was a sad day. It was right before Valentine's Day. I'll never forget it. I was, I was on the verge of crying. I think a lot of you probably were also. This was not a happy day for us. And at the time, it looked all but certain that Hillary Clinton would replace Justice Scalia, um, Merrick Garland, or someone else. Who knew? Academics on the left were thrilled. They were putting out wish lists of precedents to overrule. Like, none of it actually mattered, right? You know, just, just you know, you make a grocery list. Check, 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 get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of this. And they said, you know, do we overrule Heller? Or do we just limit Heller to keeping a gun at home? Hmm. You know, this is a strategy for people on the left. With us, it's like, can we be sure our people are going to be solid? Then it's okay, we know they're solid. Just how far do they go? You know, it's, just, it's a much different conversation. There's no, there's, no, there's no debate. They don't, Democrats don't need a list because there's no doubt when it matters, Heller vote. It just, it, it doesn't matter. Now, that's why we have a list of, well, what was it 400 people need it? How many people want a list? The, they can go up to 500? I've lost count. I think it's the entire, Federal Society Directory is now in the is on the Trump list. So it might be one of you. We'll do a Hollywood Squares approach. You know, it could be you. Except we didn't have Judge Mady. <laughs> I think that was an omission. You know, from the Third Circuit, I put this on the Vol conspiracy. On the Third Circuit, uh, President Trump added Judge Phipps to the list, which I think was a very smart ad. I think he absolutely warrants inclusion. But uh, Jersey Strong. Um, I think uh, Judge Mady should be on the list also, but you know, maybe, maybe next time we we'll 75 people. We'll just, you know, we'll expand it another time. But, you know, it's hard making these lists because there's so many good people to choose from. It's actually a, it's a good prompt to have. I, I mean that sincerely. It's, it's a good prompt to have. But back to the issue at hand, Scalia passed and it looked like Clinton would put on whatever judge she wanted. And it looked like Heller was going to be a dead letter. Right, that there were going to be five votes over Heller, which is something close to it. Um, but President Trump came out with this list, and he promised to appoint judges who would be strong in the Second Amendment. And if you look at the polling data, a lot of people said they voted for Trump because of judges. Um, there's pretty good data to back this up, and I think a lot of people were um, convinced that he would be a 
a good person to vote for because of his commitment to the judges. And we all know that too well. And he won. He won. Um, in 2017, he put on um, Justice uh, Judge Gorsuch to the Supreme Court to replace the Scalia seat. And then the next year, he put on Justice Brett Kavanaugh to fill the Kennedy seat. So at this point, things are looking better. Right? We now have five, well, it's been how you count, but now we have at least five people who seem to be solid on Heller, which raises a dilemma. Who in Heller was responsible for adding that language about sensitive places? Who in Heller wanted to add that language about dangerous and unusual weapons? Sure was not Scalia, was not Nino. And for years I wondered, huh, was it Kennedy? Maybe it was Alito? Maybe it was Roberts? Who could it be? You know, it's a game of like Clue, who done it, right? You know, in the library with the candlestick, right? Who, who, who put it in there? Um, I think we would find out soon enough. In January of 2019, the court finally granted review in a Second Amendment case. Finally, we're talking almost eight years after Heller, right? January 2019, the court grants review in a gun case. I'm oh, sorry, I can't count. So it was almost 10, more than 10 years after Heller. I, I can't count. Did they choose a case about the right to carry? No. Did they choose a case about the right to have uh, uh, an AR-15? No. Did they choose a case about safe storage laws? No. Did they choose a case about magazine capacity? No. Do they cho choose a case about um, restoring gun rights for people who previously were involved in uh, some, some nonviolent crimes? No. What case did they take? The most narrow, obscure, insignificant case I've ever heard of. New York, right across the Hudson. Uh, I think if you go there, Governor Cuomo makes you check into the, uh, the checkpoint. Do you know what the airports are actually taking people's papers? If you land from Houston to LaGuardia, there's actually a, a, an agent waiting for you at the gate, taking your information and mandating that you take a COVID test within five days. It's, it's remarkable. I, I, anyway, I, I digress. I think if I landed in New York, they'd probably arrest me. <laughs> I'm afraid of going to Newark. General Graywell may have me thrown up in the, in the slammer also. Um, but in 2019, the court finally grants a case from New York. It's called the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus New York City. New York had this bizarre law that says, if you want to bring your gun to a shooting range, no, not carrying it, bring your gun in a locked box where it's disassembled to a, to a shooting range, right? Outside the city of New York, you need a special permit. Or if you want to bring your gun in a locked box to your second home, let's say it's in Long Island somewhere, right? You need a special permit. And the city won't give you this permit if you ask for it. So it's basically impossible to bring your gun to a shooting range outside of New York or to bring your gun to your second home. You're basically stuck with your gun at home, okay? Um, now, let's say you live in Staten Island, right? And you want to go to a shooting range in New Jersey. They're actually much closer. No, you have to go to the Bronx to go to a shooting range, right? This was a huge burden for people, right? They were, I mean, traveling from Staten Island to the Bronx is a schlep. It's, it, <laughs> this may not seem bad, but this is actually a very long drive. Right? I, I can count on one hand how often I went to the Bronx as a kid. You just don't go there. It's far. Okay? So this law was irrational. It was irrational. It made no sense. Yet the S Southern District of New York upheld the law. The Second Circuit upheld the law. And New York was happy to defend it. They had no, they had no problem. But then the court grants review. And OMG... New York flips out, like, no, 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 we can't have this. So New York engineered, New York engineered this strategy to moot the case. It's brilliant, really. The city repealed the law. Then the state enacted a statute that it made it impossible for the city to reenact the law. It was literally impossible to reenact this law. You couldn't do it. 
It's like they dropped it in a vat of acid and they burned it off the earth. It was just, it was gone. It, it could not exist. It was just, as I say, canceled, right? It was just, they canceled the law, basically. Who needs to veto a law when you can cancel a law? Much more strong. And then New York said, well, Supreme Court, I know you granted review, but, you know, you don't really want this case. It's moot, right? Why are you going to decide a moot case? You don't have to decide it. Aha. So even if this case was decided, it was pretty insignificant. But now it became clear that it didn't really need to be decided. Now, I actually think this case was moot. I mean, I can be objective. I like gun cases, but this, this case is moot. I can, be, I can be objective about that. But then there was pressure. We had a brief from Senator uh, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse from, uh, uh, was he from uh, Rhode Island? Thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking of, I'll think of Blumenthal from Connecticut. I was the, the other one. Uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, who, who submitted a brief to the Supreme Court, an amicus brief, which said, hey, Supreme Court, this case is moot. But guess what? If you disagree, we'll give you some new friends, some new colleagues. Oh, yes, court packing. You had a senator basically threaten court packing in a Supreme Court brief. He called it reform. My goodness, reform. <laughs> if only FDR had Twitter, right? And we need reform of the court, reform. The case was argued, and it was dismissed a few months later. Um, Justice Alito dissented, joined by Gorsuch and Thomas. And that was my signal that Alito was not the not the cause of the dicta. I had, you know, he's from New Jersey. He was a prosecutor. I didn't know where he was on guns. I just, I just didn't know. But this showed me that it wasn't him. And he said that uh, the state of New York was trying to manipulate the court's docket. Uh, he's right. And also he suggested that the lower courts screwed up, right? That this is not how Heller was supposed to be interpreted. And he said, we should review these cases. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, the newest member of the court, concurred with the dismissal. I think he was right. This was moot. But then he said, and I want to read you the sentence. This was from April. The court should address this issue very soon. Perhaps, excuse me, perhaps in one of the several Second Amendment cases pending for the court. At the time, there were 10. I only have 10 fingers. But that's how many I need. There were 10 cert petitions pending for the court. 10. Some were from New York. Uh, so I think there was one from Pennsylvania. Um, uh, there was one from Texas. They were all over the map. And these raised every possible issue. Concealed carry, felon rights, magazine capacity, assault weapon ban, right? Every possible issue was raised. You could raise all these issues. They were all present at the court. So Kavanaugh saying, okay, fine. Don't take this case, whatever. Let's just take another one. Right, we'll take another one and we'll do this next year. And I'm like, okay, cool. Kavanaugh knows what he's doing, right? Kavanaugh is a smart dude. If he's saying we should take another case, that was my signal to say, okay, Kavanaugh knows what's up. They're just going to grant another case. There's, there's enough votes to grant. Don't worry, Josh. So I was optimistic. And again, Nelson was right, right? My optimism was misplaced. I thought, look, if you have Alito, Gorsuch, Thomas, the three dissenters, you have Kavanaugh, that's four. That's all you need for certiorari, right? You got four. You're done. We're home free. There are four justices saying, let's take a gun case. Good, right? Are we we're home free? Are we set? Of course not. Fast forward to Monday, June 15th, 2020. Um, I call that day uh, Blue June, Blue Monday. It sucked. Um, in a very short time frame, conservatives lost everything at the Supreme Court. Everything. The court denied review in 10. 10 Second Amendment cases all at once. The court also denied review in a sanctuary city case from San Francisco, from California. And then 30 minutes later, Justice Gorsuch wrote the Bostock opinion, which interpreted Title VII to prohibit discrimination against gays, lesbians, and transgender people. So in this matter of 30 minutes with this, you know, conservative court, right, just blows up. This was a rough day. 
Um, now, Justice Thomas dissented from the denial of review in one of those cases. Rogers versus Graywall, who's your, your attorney general, who I, I've sued several times now in several different courts. Uh, it's, I'm, sure, I'm sure he likes me. I'm sure it's not personal. <laughs> he has no idea who I am, uh, which is probably for the best. But if I land at Newark, I'll have like a, a, a New Jersey State trooper waiting for Mr. Blackman to come here. <laughs> um, but Justice Thomas dissented in the, um, I see Nick's here. I, I spoke at Rutgers last year. I gave it a similar spiel. So this is my, uh, this is my, my spiel. So Justice Thomas dissented in Rogers versus Graywall. Um, and this was a challenge to uh, New Jersey's public carry law. I don't need to remind you, it's basically impossible in New Jersey to get a carry license unless you're powerful and important, right? Just schmoes like us can't get them, but if you're powerful, you'll get one. That's just, you know, that, that's how it works. Um, Justice Thomas forcefully dissented, joined by Justice Kavanaugh. And he wrote, in several jurisdictions throughout the country, law-abiding citizens have been barred from exercising the right to bear arms because they cannot show they have a justifiable need or good reason for doing so. Thomas writes, one would think that such an owner's burden on a fundamental right would warrant this court's review. He adds, this court almost certainly review the constitutionality of a law requiring citizens to establish a justifiable need before exercising their free speech rights. And it seems highly unlikely that the court would allow a state to enforce a law, right for this, requiring a woman to provide a justifiable need before seeking an abortion. But today, faced with a petition challenging gestature restriction on citizens' Second Amendment rights, the court simply looks the other way. And turn, turn to the left if you notice that one. They look, they look the other way. Um, what happened here? Well, after the court's term concluded... Uh, there were some leaks. Yes, there are leaks to the Supreme Court. It's a sieve. Uh, Joan Biskupic of CNN wrote a series of articles. Um, a lot of the stuff they wrote wasn't new. Uh, it wasn't earth-shattering. But there was some stuff there that confirmed what, what I thought and what a lot of people thought. And it turns out that the turd in the punch bowl, as they say, was the chief, of course. He was the one holding back the cases. And apparently the chief signaled at the conference that he didn't want to take another gun case. Or more precisely, if he were to take the New Jersey case, he would have affirmed. If he were to, if he were to take the New Jersey case, he would have affirmed. In other words, leaving the New Jersey law in place and letting every state copy New Jersey's regime. Uh, Thomas dissented, joined only by, Ka by Justice Kavanaugh in part. Uh, Alito and Gorsuch did not dissent. I think there's some weird back channels going on with the chief. I don't fully understand it. And so it continues. 12 years after Heller, we are in the exact same place. When Heller was decided, I didn't have glasses, didn't have gray hair. My hair was actually a lot smaller at that time. This is my COVID haircut, right? Um, but we're in the same place. The government cannot ban the possession of handguns in the home, but all other gun control laws are reasonable. Keep in mind, there are only two jurisdictions in the country that ban handguns, Chicago and D.C. So the upshot of Heller is two cases and two laws are gone. That's it. That's all, folks. That's it. Uh, Robbie George, who's a professor at Princeton in your in your backyard, uh, has an, has analogized uh, judicial conservatives to the Washington generals. You know, where they go up, they fight, and they know they're going to lose. That's how I feel in the Second Amendment sometimes, that I'm going up against globetrotters. I am going to lose. Um, and it doesn't matter what we do. There have been, every now and then, favorable decisions in the Second Amendment. 
Unfortunately, there used to be dissents. Um, Justice Thomas flagged several of them. Uh, one case was a case called Matz versus Sessions. Uh, it was an opinion by Judge Elrod, joined by uh, Elrod, Jones, Smith, Willett, Hope, Duncan, Engelhart. That's seven. But you need eight to grant en banc. And of course, President Trump had a fight with Mississippi Senator, don't get me started. But there were seven. Well, guess what? The Fifth Circuit's at full strength, my friends. We are at eight. And we're going to get a gun case that goes en banc where gun control law is held unconstitutional. And at that point, John Roberts will have to basically step up or step off. No, that's the wrong one. Yeah, I said that in another context. He'll have to address this issue. Um, I know what I'm saying here is probably going to be unpopular, but I'm convinced the only way to change the status quo is to give the chief a case he has to take, which is basically a Fifth Circuit decision where the Solicitor General appeals. Um, what I'm about to say is controversial. I would much rather lose 5-4, 6-3 and know where the justices stand than keep showing up in a fixed match to the Globetrotters. I don't like the status quo. It doesn't help any of us. I don't want to keep getting my, 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 my butt kicked in. This, it's almost a waste of time. How many briefs, how many lawsuits, how many articles do you have to write about the Second Amendment? Just tell us what it is. If it doesn't mean anything, we'll move on and let people know about it. Uh, but this sort of status quo, um, I find uh, unacceptable. Um, fortunately, we have judges in the Fifth Circuit who I think can give us a good ruling. Judge Mady wrote an excellent decision in this, um, uh, it's not New York pistol and rifle, it's called the uh, New Jersey pistol and rifle case, which involves magazine capacity sizes. Uh, you know, for decades, New Jersey could let you have 15 rounds, and all of a sudden, no, no, 10. Well, you only need 10. Is there any evidence to show why you need 10? No, 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 but you need 10. Why 10? Why not three? Why not one? Go back to a musket, just, you know, single fire, you know, little musket ball. Um, I don't know if the votes are there in the Third Circuit to go on bonk. There were two other Republican appointed judges in that panel. It was Judge Roth and, oh, who's the, who's the other one? Uh, I'm blanking on the other one's name. It was Judge Roth and um, uh, Jordan. Uh, so, I mean, this wasn't a liberal panel. But I think just most judges are, they don't see value in the Second Amendment. And if you don't see value, it's an easy thing to rule on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my own litigation in New Jersey. Um, since 2015, oh my God, it's been five years, I've represented Defense Distributed. Um, this was the firm in Austin, Texas that developed the first 3D printed firearm. Uh, this litigation has been going on forever and ever and ever. I won't bore you with all of it. But um, in 2018, about two years ago, I first met your attorney general in court. Um, the Trump administration reached a settlement agreement with us to dismiss the claims, um, which would have basically allowed uh, my client to put some files on the Internet, which you could download and use to 3D print a firearm. Um, New Jersey had enacted a law that makes it a crime to put files on the internet to print a gun. It's a crime under New Jersey law. It's also a crime to advertise it, to talk about it, to solicit it, etc. Um, there's so many ways that law is unconstitutional, but we didn't really care about it right away. But shortly after we reached a settlement with the State Department, um, your Attorney General joined a 20-state coalition and sued us in Seattle, because New Jersey really has an interest in Seattle's jurisdiction. It's very important there. And New Jersey sought a nationwide injunction to block our settlement. And I argued that case, uh, and I lost. But also, we got another lawsuit from your attorney general. He sued us. Ready for this? Essex County Chancery Court. I'm not joking you. He sought a temporary restraining order, and what's called restraints, and it's called something weird. It's called, he sought restraints against us in the Essex County Chancery Court. And his claim was, you ready for this? Nuisance. He said that putting a file on the internet was a common law nuisance, as if I was playing loud music at a party. And you ready for this? He asked a chancery judge for a nationwide injunction against a Texas company to stop putting files on the internet. 
All right. Now, I'm not going to dump on this judge. I think this judge is actually one of the best judges we had. I won't say his name. It's not important now, but I thought he did a good job. We had a hearing on telephone, right? Uh, I couldn't get to New Jersey for this immediate hearing. I was being sued across the country. I had, I had to argue four TROs in five days in five states. Um, this was fun. Your, your attorney general kept me on the move. Also Shapiro up in Pennsylvania as well. Um, but this judge in, in Chancery Court, um, I thought was very fair. And we had a hearing last lasts about an hour. Uh, you could tell his court was not set up for this. He had a, basically a speakerphone on his desk. It wasn't like an actual polycom. It was a, it was a regular phone. Couldn't hear anything he was saying. It was pretty tough, but I think he was a good judge. And he went through the factors and he realized that under New Jersey law, you have a very broad definition of a nuisance. Apparently in New Jersey, everything's a nuisance. Um, bringing a gun into Newark is a nuisance apparently in New Jersey. It's a bizarre precedent. So he said, well, under, under law, I think putting a file on the internet would be a nuisance. But yeah, there's a thing called the First Amendment. Yeah. So the judge denied the TRO. Um, so I actually got a win in New Jersey Chancery Court. Who the hell knew, right? I, I'd be arguing in New Jersey Chancery Court for a Second Amendment case. Who knew, right? Uh, but that case is still ongoing. But actually, I'm sorry. That case, we removed the federal court and sort of just pettered out. Uh, but then we actually sued the Attorney General of New Jersey. We sued him in federal court in in um, in Austin. Uh, we claimed he had reached out to us and he availed himself of the jurisdiction. Um, we actually lost in the trial court, but the Fifth Circuit... The Fifth Circuit ruled in our favor, and the Fifth Circuit found this personal jurisdiction. Uh, Graywell filed a petition for a hearing on Bonk about a week ago in the Fifth Circuit. We'll see what happens there. Um, but we also sued him in New Jersey, in district court there. Um, this case went on forever, freaking forever, uh, because the district court said, I will not touch this case. She was a judge in Trent. I can't remember her name. Thompson, maybe? Uh, she said, I will not move on this case um, unless the Texas case is resolved. Um, so then we took an interlocutory appeal to the Third Circuit. Um, panel held there was no appellate jurisdiction. We got a dissent from Judge Phipps. Then eventually the panel reissued their opinion and sort of massaged it a bit. Then we did another round of briefing and they ruled against us again. Um, and we filed a petition for a hearing on Bonk in the Third Circuit. So we now have basically two en banc petitions pending in two appellate courts um, in these cases. Uh, we're also on appeal in the Ninth Circuit. We had a totally other case from the, from the Washington case. Another, another case is pending in the Ninth Circuit, which is an en banc petition as well. So this litigation is a mess. Now, if you notice, all this has been about the First Amendment. We haven't even touched the Second Amendment in this case. It just hasn't even gotten any traction. Uh, maybe judges will like free speech more than guns. I don't know. But I, I want to come back to the theme of our talk today, which is the, the, the Second Amendment. Unless we get another justice in the court, I think the only way to have a solid 5-4 conservative court is with seven conservative judges. I think if we get seven, we get a solid 5-4 majority in any given case. If we get two more, maybe, I think we get a, a win on the Second Amendment. I think that's what we need. But as the court's presently constituted, I don't see a way that Roberts gives anything to the Second Amendment. He wanted that obscure case from New York that didn't matter. Maybe you get a felon disenfranchisement case, which is kind of obscure, uh, but a case on carry, right? A case on uh, assault, assault rifles, um, a case on uh, magazines. You know, I think my friends in New Jersey, uh, you are getting no relief from the courts. Uh, if you want to have a gun, uh, come on down to Texas. I think I see Lisa somewhere on the call, so this is for her also. Okay, uh, that's all I have. I'd love to take questions from everyone, and hopefully we could have a have a lovely conversation. Thank you so much. So everybody, you know, um, ask your questions in the chat, or just say you have a question, and I'll, I'll call on you. I, I did get a question from um, from Ted Frank, who's having difficulty with his, his Zoom. Um, Ted. Ted <laughs> he's a technological genius. Um, Ted wants to know... If Roberts was sending that signal, why the four on the left on the court didn't grant cert to overturn Heller? It's a really good question. Um, so I mentioned Blue Monday, which is Monday, June 15th. The court did not review in 10 Second Amendment cases. The court also did not review in four qualified immunity cases. I think there's a quid pro quo. I think in a deal with Kagan, we don't take guns, we don't take QI. I think, that, I think that was a deal. I have absolutely nothing to prove it. But, but 
they were both denied in the same day that the qualified immunity cases were pending for, you know, I think a month or two forever. And the Second Amendment cases were pending. I think the deal was we're denying all of them. We move on. The ter- this term was big enough. You had abortion. You had uh, uh, DACA. You know, you had all these huge issues. Just move on. Um, if I am Elena Kagan, I take that deal. Right. I, I say, OK, we leave Heller in this weird status quo. Uh, and, you know, we, we do qualified immunity later. They can always get it later. It, you know, with liberals, a long game works. With us, it never works because our long game doesn't last very long. That's fair point. And I see a comment. Newark is one of the best airports. I agree. I used to fly there all the time. And seriously, from my parents' house to Newark was 20 minutes tops. Um, I used to know every lounge by heart, who everything was. Now I don't know anything there. It's all different. It's all closed. I feel I feel, I feel lost. But the, but the Houston to Newark flight, I would do that one in my sleep. I could just, I knew it by heart. Okay, I have another question. I mean, you you raised this earlier in your in your discussion um, that you were concerned when Heller came down that there was no discussion of tiers of scrutiny. Yeah. Um, I remember those days very vividly as yeah. well, and and I, I it's funny I, I I so identify with that sort of excitedly reading the, the the opinion and everything. But my read on that was that that was really the strength of Heller that it wasn't using the same sort of tiers of scrutiny that's arguably not remotely an originalist sort of methodology anyway, and that it's a sort of a, a, an, an originalist scope of the protection analysis, right? And um, and that A, that that's a strength, but, um, and maybe we disagree about this, but 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 if that's right, um, my, my question was whether you thought that the circuit courts that have sort of imported mm-hmm. a tiers of scrutiny and a two-step analysis are in fact consistent with Heller. Yeah, excellent question, Lita. If Scalia had said, we reject scrutiny and we follow history, then I'm game. But he didn't say that. He left it open. And and Breyer knew it would happen, right? Breyer knew that the lower courts will try and squeeze it into the tiers of scrutiny. So they call it intermediate Everything's intermediate screening. It doesn't matter. It's always intermediate, right? Um, that was the failure of Heller. If 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 you read just uh, Judge Kavanaugh's opinion in a case called Heller Two, he's hardcore saying, "Look, Scalia is saying do history." I think that's a plausible reading of Heller. I don't know if it's the best reading of Heller, because if Kavanaugh was right, then what's this dangerous places dicta and the sensitive places and this all this other stuff? The dangerous person. Yeah. That stuff was not originalist, right? You had a originalist opinion from top, almost the bottom. But at the bottom, they sort of go off into left field. So I think the failure of Heller was a decision not to put that in there. All right. Um, Nick, you have a question? Hey, Professor Blackman, good to see you. Sure, good to see you again. Are you still at Rutgers? I can't remember if you graduated or not. I am on a 3L this year. Okay, that's right. Well, hope to see you at some point this year also. Absolutely. Um, my question is, and I, I think I suspect I might know the answer to this already, but do you think that the chief, if you were to read the tea leaves a little bit here, might be inclined to take a Second Amendment case if it was brought to him um, on the basis of some broad federal action that would really rock the boat in a way that, you know, state by state <clears throat> legislation and gun control might not. Yeah. So I think what you have to keep in mind is if there's a petition from a, the, the federal government, the Solicitor General petition, it's national. If the Fifth Circuit declares a federal gun law and constitutional rubber test to take it, they can't pass it. You know, if California or if New Jersey or if New York passes a law you know, whoop de doo it's just one state, right? People who don't like guns can move, right? Um, so I, th- I, th- I think I think you're asking a fair question. Uh, but I think if, if, you know, if an actual federal gun control law is ruled on, const- you know, let, let's say President Biden enacts a federal assault weapons ban, there's a 0% chance we're fine some constitutional issues. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Thank you for the question. Thank you. All right, uh, Sean, you have a question? You 
You can mute yourself, Sean. Yes, Sean. So, what was my question? Uh, Fred, this is probably an uninformed question. I think. So where are we right now with the number of justices who uh, believe that, they, that the Constitution contains no individual right to bear arms at all? But what is the count on that? Well, look, in Heller, the four dissenters said there was no right. It was militia-based. Um, Justice Stevens is not with us anymore. Um, Justice Souter is not with us anymore. Oh, he's, he's alive. He's not in the court anymore. Uh, so you had Ginsburg and Breyer still with us. Um, and McDonald, you had Justice Sotomayor um, uh, join the, the, the McDonald dissenters. I think she's on board. I don't know that Kagan has ever taken a position on this. I, I don't think she has. So at least three. Um, I don't know where Kagan would fall. I think the number is at least three, maybe more. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah, everybody, this is fun. Have your questions. Um, do you feel so? So maybe let's talk a little bit more about what you were sort of suggesting is the um, the sort of the strategy that might actually persuade the court to take a case. Um, yeah, you need to bring it. You need to bring a case in a circuit that's favorable to to, to gun second law, second amendment laws, right? Um, the Ninth Circuit's getting better, but still, uh, the en banc numbers, numbers are not good. Every single time in the Ninth Circuit you draw a good panel, it gets reversed en banc. Every single time. I mean, 100% it gets reversed. Um, and one of the rubs is the chief judge, Sidney Thomas, a Clinton appointee, always sits in the en banc panel. So you have this advantage. By the way, I've done the math. There will not be a Republican appointed chief judge in the Ninth Circuit for like 30 years. Right, all the W noms are getting skipped over. It's gonna go straight from Clinton to Obama. So we're, I mean, like, I think it was a Dan Collins, one of the Trump appointees will be the next chief judge, next Republican chief judge, like in thirty years or something insane. It's just, it. it so basically, the the, the 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 Ninth Circuit is stacked to have panels that are hostile to the Second Amendment. So California can do whatever it wants. You need a challenge to a federal law from the Fifth Circuit, or maybe the Eighth Circuit. Um, the states in the Eighth Circuit are generally pretty good for guns, Miss Minnesota, whatever, but they're generally decent. Um, the Second Circuit is, is close. Uh, the Third Circuit is so-called flipped, but look, you guys just lost the Third Circuit with three Republican judges. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be hard to win that one on Bonk. So I think you, you need a Fifth Circuit or an Eighth Circuit case. It's the only way I can think about it. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, depending on who your panel is on the Third Circuit, you know, I think you could probably get to the right outcome, but right. The en banc court's a tricky one. Your en banc is, is, is looking kind of dicey. The en banc is close, especially with judges Roth and, uh, well, Roth is senior, I guess, but Jordan is not senior. Uh, and he wrote an opinion to the, the Heller two-step. You know, it's, is it in the core and in burdening? I can't remember the steps. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Once they and say... Right, and I mean, and that's the thing is that seems to be so inconsistent with the analytical approach of Heller. Yeah. Um, right, and if you've got circuit court judges issuing decisions that are sort of built on an analysis that's at odds with the applicable Supreme Court case, then you know how are these circuit courts even binding on their own circuit? Yeah, it, it's open. A resistance, you know, we talk about the resistance, the Viva Libre Resistance, right? It's resistance to Heller. There's no other way to describe it. These judges are openly resisting Heller. And the Supreme Court has not lifted a finger to correct them. In any other context, if lower court judges were defying Supreme Court ruling, John Roberts would personally go and bang a gavel on their heads, right? Sure. He's. Well, look, I mean, New Jersey is also a sort of a fantastic hotbed of creative arbitration jurisprudence, right? Um, but every year, the Supreme Court just sort of in, you know, time out of their lives, they're never getting back, takes some number of, uh, arbit you know, arbitration resistance cases, right, just to kind of to, to, to smack it down. I mean, I think that's, you know, and that's arbitration, which I care about. But, you know, um, Shalom, you have a question. I do. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit about the math for the Third Circuit, and I want to just uh, quibble a little bit with your pessimism. Okay. So, follow me a little bit. And I'm the happy, first, to be, I am happy to be wrong, by the way. I'm happy to be wrong on this one. So the first panel opinion comes from 
Schwartz, Greenery, and Beavis, and Beavis dissents. That's right. The second decision, as you pointed out, comes from Jordan Mady and Roth. Mady dissents. But Jordan and Roth did not rule against the Second Amendment. They didn't really take a position at all on the Second Amendment. What they said was that under rule, the law of the case, the first panel, the Schwartz-Greenaway panel, minus Beavis, had already ruled on this issue in this docket on this case, and so we're not going to tackle that. And I'm not here to tell you what Jordan and Roth are going to do on the next panel decision or what Jordan would do on an en banc decision, because as you say, Roth is excluded. But I think counting them out is a little premature. Well, let me, let me answer your question with some pessimism. Um, when there's a Second Amendment case, judges always find a way to avoid ruling on the merits. They always find procedural ways to dodge the issue. It's so painful. My New Jersey case, when I mentioned, has been in appellate jurisdiction limbo for two years. Like I'm in purgatory. If judges Jordan and Roth agreed with Mady, they could have had a special concurrence saying we agree on the merits. Right? They could have joined it. Right? You can write a majority opinion and dissent from your majority opinion. They could have. I, I, look, all I'm saying is in gun case, when, when it's a case involving Trump, they find every way to find jurisdiction. They'll find a way to, you know, different, distinguish, you know, whatever. But in gun cases, it's just, it's just this bizarre, um, this bizarre limbo that, that, that you're always stuck in. All right. And I, I mean, and I have time for one more question, Lita, and then uh, we can. Absolutely, yeah. And I, and I want to agree with Shalom, but honestly, I mean, maybe did a really good job of addressing that law of the case question. So, well, or I'm not sure that I agree with Paul's approach to law of the case, but that's beyond the topic for today. Yeah, sure. All right. We have time for one more question. Uh, Paul, let's go with you. Paul, you're muted. Get done yourself. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Good. Muted? Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I was wondering. Um, I wanted to talk about McDonald. Yeah. Uh, I was curious why wasn't that nine to zero? It seemed um, that the uh, incorporation should have been pretty easy um, just to apply it across the uh, you know, across the country. I mean, most other rights under the lights are already incorporated. Why? Why the resistance? I mean, I, I remember the case, and Breyer kept talking about Heller and getting, how he dissented, and he stopped talking about you know rights and uh, how dangerous guns are. But we didn't seem to dodge the, uh, the whole idea of incorporation. I just, yeah, yeah. I about that. What, what do you think? Yeah, it's a good question, Paul. I mean, the the standard for incorporation is almost automatic. Um, virtually every right in the Bill of Rights has been incorporated. Um, this past term, we had a case about incorporating, uh, was it the unanimous jury rule, which is not actually in the constitution, which makes it a little bit weirder. And there actually was a lot of fragmentation, whether you incorporate the unanimous jury case. Um, but under any reading of incorporation doctrine, this should have been a nine zero case. I think the dissenters were just bitter about Heller. They lost it and they were still fighting about it. And if they thought Heller was wrong, then McDonald was also wrong. But yeah, there's just no, there's no reason why Heller was not 9-0. It, sh it should have been 9-0. But, but I think just the, when a case involves guns, judges do things that they usually would not do. And I, I, I don't, I don't mean that as a pejorative. It, it's, it's a descriptive sense. Just in a decade of litigation, 12 years of litigation, when guns are involved, all the usual rules go out the window. Jurisdictional rules are discovered thin air. Right, appellate issues are found at the last minute. Mooted cases, right, change positions. Um, there's always some way to keep a gun case off the docket, which is why this humble lawyer sitting here in Houston, Texas, would want a 5 4 loss to just get over this rather than just pretending there's something there. Or we get another justice next year who replaces Justice Breyer, Justice Ginsburg, and we get 6 5 4, we win. And then John Roberts can complain about dissent. But I, I need a resolution. I need something. 
uh, because I spent my, basically my entire adult life waiting for this ruling that has not come yet. Um, right. well, Justice Thomas uh, wrote a fairly compelling concurrence. Why do you suppose that he, he wasn't persuasive? Um, we have about a minute and a half, so I, I don't know. I think Justice Thomas has been dissenting for five years, and um, I think his colleagues, or when I say colleagues, I mean Roberts just doesn't care. Roberts only res- Roberts never responds unless he thinks there's a reason to respond. In the South Bay case, he, he wrote a concurrence to tell the lower court judges, let the governors do whatever they want with COVID. It doesn't matter. Um, but in the Second Amendment, he needs no guidance. They know what to do. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you so much. And I look forward to visiting you all in New Jersey. Hopefully in person, we can all celebrate soon enough. Thank you so much, Lita. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Take care. And everybody.